Hello and welcome back to Make Do. David here with another project. We, like many of you back in November, have been playing the new God of War Ragnarok. We know we are very behind. And the whole time I was playing, all I could think was, I need to make that. For my build, I'm going to be using the beautiful files designed by Yarman Props, which are available on Etsy. I'll leave a link in the description below. Oh, and big shout out to our patron Connor for recommending these SCL files, which were both a breeze to use and amazingly detailed. I printed the axe handle on Polyterra's PLA on our Prusa i3 Mark III. For the axe head, I opted to print all the parts in resin on our Anycubic Photon Mono X to make sure all the detail in the runes came out extra crispy. Hey, James here. David ended up changing a lot of plans on this build, so the other products you see here, we didn't end up using them. We'll have a full list of supplies we actually used in the description below. Did everything just stop? That was really weird, guys. I don't feel very good. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i be right back. This project is going to incorporate a lot of really cool techniques, including some faux wood texturing, a new weathered metal look, leather wrapping, and some of the coolest lighting we have pulled off on the channel so far. So far. Be sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on all our future projects. Me too. So, let's get started. I started off by printing the accent in resin on our Anycubic Photon Mono X. To fit within the smaller print area of the resin printer, this was printed in four separate pieces that have already been divided in the print files. These prints just required a little bit of cleanup to ensure everything fit together nicely. I then glued the axe head pieces together using 5 minute epoxy along with a little bit of CA glue to hold everything in place while the 5 minute epoxy cured. While the axe head was curing, I started to assemble the handle. And that brings us to our first file modification. For the battery pack that we're going to be using for our lighting rig, more info on that a little later, I needed more space. This basically needs to fit in here, and it just doesn't fit. To remedy this, I went into Prusa Slicer and removed some material to make room for our battery setup. Then re-sliced and sent to the printer, again. While the replacement head was printing, I got to work gluing up the rest of the handle. In an effort to reduce support material usage, I ended up splitting each handle segment in half. This isn't necessary and the files don't actually come this way, but it did give me cleaner prints in the end and helped me to align the wood grain with the direction of the print layers. I cleaned everything up, removing the little support material needed and wiping everything down with some isopropyl alcohol. I really wanted everything to glue together solidly, so I made sure the surfaces were prepped for maximum adhesion. If I was patient, I could have gone in and sanded the gluing surfaces with just a little more grab, but I didn't. I glued all the segment halves together using some more 5 minute epoxy and CA glue. I also wrapped the pieces together with some masking tape to try and prevent any gaps forming while the epoxy cured. While that was curing, I gave the axe head its first of many coats of filler primer. This replacement head will fit the battery and lighting rig much better. I just glued this up like the other handle segments and left everything to cure overnight. But it's five minute epoxy, why did you have to wait overnight? The next day I could safely remove all the tape and put the handle together. The handle segments have these registration keys that ensure everything is seated together and creates more surface area for the epoxy to bond to. Don't worry about any minor gaps at this stage, these will be filled later on down the line or be covered with some leather strapping. To really make this handle strong, I reinforced the whole construction with some quarter inch threaded steel rod. The model comes pre-drilled with grooves for this steel rod, however, due to the curved handle it requires two separate rods. It took me a second to figure out exactly how long each rod needed to be, 
mostly because I didn't measure the grooves when it was split in two, but lucky for you, we have those measurements for you and you don't have to be stupid like me. You'll need a 16 inch piece for the lower portion of the handle and a 14 and a half inch for the upper portion. Quick note, if you are not inserting the electronics like we're doing, you will need a longer upper portion. We're not really sure how big that needs to be, sorry. Oh, also our sad little hacksaw could not cut through the threaded rod and we had to run to Lowe's five minutes before closing to get a new one. So thank you to all our patrons who make buying the appropriate tools possible. Oh, and for keeping us properly caffeinated. Yes, thank you to all of our patrons. With everything cut, I then assembled the handle. Again, using plenty of epoxy and masking tape to hold things in place. It was at this point that I finally realized just how big this axe was going to be. Holy sh! I'm just now realizing how big this axe is going to be. Okay, back to the axe head. This thing had a few gaps that needed addressing. Just like with our Stormtrooper helmet, I used this 3M green spot putty. It does a great job filling sizable gaps and dries really fast. I made sure to take my time and not fill in any of the runic etchings on the axe head. That would be bad. I then use the same techniques on the handle, taking care to try and match the wood grain wherever I can. And then it was time for some classic sanding to smooth everything out again. I ended up doing a couple of passes of primer, spot putty, and sanding on both the axe head and the handle to make sure everything was as seamless as I could get it. This triangular needle file came in handy when it came to redefining the wood grain that got filled with spot putty. I don't know who did that. Also, be sure to wear a mask. All this dust is not good for you. It's good for James, though. Once everything was nice and smooth and sanded to around 220 grit, I gave all the parts a final pass of primer. Then I'm ready to move on to painting. Oh yeah, before priming the axe handle, I taped off the top area where the head will eventually be mounted. I wanted to make sure that the axe head didn't have to be forced on later due to excess layers of paint. I started by painting the parts that will eventually end up metallic silver, the axe head and these land jets, a flat black that also doubles as a second coat of primer. This is a slightly different metallic paint process than we normally do, but it will give us a more weathered, hand forged look to the finished pieces. Don't paint it this way. I got a lot of little drips on the root details and it fell over. I ended up having to sand this back down and reapply the black base coat. So just lay the whole head flat, paint one side, and flip it to get the other side once it's dry. I also gave these small roundels a coat of metallic gold. These will receive some additional weathering later on. While the metallic piece is dry, I moved on to painting the handle. I have found that cheap acrylics and even cheaper brushes are perfect for making a faux wood texture. I have gotten these brushes from I don't even know where. I think I just found them on the street one day. I start with a mixture of brown, black, and water to give the whole handle a good base coat, making sure that every nook and cranny was filled.
The axe in the game has a reddish color to it, so the next layer I mix in some bright red to our browns and blacks. I'm not too concerned with the paint being mixed or even leaving brush strokes. This will end up just adding to the wood grain texture. For the final layer, I added in some yellow to my brown mixture to create a highlight color. And with my crunchiest brush, I lightly went over the surface to pull out all the fine detail of the wood grain. Really, this model is just absurd. If you could see my face right now, you would you, you could tell that I'm just shocked. And the final step was to seal this beautiful finish in. I gave it all a coat of matte clear varnish and called it done. Okay, back to the metal parts. This was a new process, so I started with a test piece to make sure I had all my steps in order. And it came out perfectly fine, so I was good to proceed. Step one was a sponge on silver paint using a sea sponge that you're never gonna wanna use again. For the silver paint, I'm doing this old trick of spraying into a cup to collect the liquid paint. Apparently this is a real technique called decanting, so that means that we're fancing now. This is a great way to utilize spray paint in different applications than just spraying. And it's a great way to destroy your lungs, so be sure to wear a mask and be safe. Then I simply sponged the paint onto the part, trying to keep the pattern rough and random as I could be. The paint will build up in certain areas and that's totally fine because it's just going to add to the texture of the piece. After the silver layers dried, I went back in with a mixture of water, black, and just a little bit of blue and sponged over the entire surface. Really, the messier the better. After that, I went back in with some more silver. The key to this technique is building up layer upon layer. The layering will build texture and literal depth to the finish that makes it more convincing. With some confidence in this new process, I was ready to paint the axe head. I used the same technique, taking my time to build up each layer of silver, then black and blue wash, then more silver, then more wash, then more silver, until I was happy with the finish. Now it was finally time to glue this piece together. As with the rest of the build, I used 5 minute epoxy. For the langettes and the roundels, I am only gluing on one side. I need the other side to be removable so I can access the electronics later on. I tape everything up, this time using some painter's tape to keep the finish safe and let everything cure. When checking our reference, James noticed that the leather wrap has a small patch of blue fabric. We thought the blue would be a little too saturated in the real world, so we found this alternative, a scaled textured leather that goes with the build perfectly. I trimmed the piece down to size and roughed up the edges. This looks a little manufactured now, but it will wear down as the axe is handled more. Once size, I attached it to the axe using hot glue. We found out on our Master Sword build that using super glue with the leather causes a gross reaction that adds a white haze to everything, so hot glue is the way to go.
For the strapping, I had to ditch our original plan because the leather we had was just too thick. So we found this softer, more worn leather, but it only came in this sheet, so I ended up cutting things down to roughly one inch strips. Like the gray leather, I attached the straps with hot glue. I didn't really plan this out too much, but I did test fit pieces before securing them. This would have been 100% easier if we had one continuous leather strap, but we didn't, so I guess we just had to make do. I traded fitted the leather pieces around the handle trying to replicate the look of a single piece, and I think it came out pretty convincing. The final part of this build is the gems, and of course we just had to add lights to them. The original plan was to cast the gems in resin, but that really didn't work out, which is its whole own story. So I ended up printing these colored gems in transparent blue resin on our Anycubic Photon Mono X. The full gem assembly also has this small ringlet that holds the gem and a small metal detail that sits on top. These metal parts got a coat of black paint followed by a coat of gold rub and buff. Then all the pieces were pressed together and held in place with a little bit of CA glue. Now for the lights. We're using something new we saw over at Tested. These wireless LEDs, and they are simply amazing. In place within this copper coil that I totally bent out of shape for reasons we will go into later, these LEDs just light up and it's the coolest thing ever. I really want to put these in every project and I honestly just might try. Anyway, before gluing the LEDs in place, I added a few pieces of vellum, which is just fancy semi-translucent paper, to the inside of the gems to help diffuse the light from the LEDs, which are then glued into the gem with the lights facing up. I'm able to fit four into each gem and I ended up mixing a few colors together just to get a more cooler, more magical gem effect. Then to seal these up, I added a piece of black cardstock to the back with a magnet in the center. This will become important later. I did take my time gluing the magnet in because for some reason, if it touches any of the LEDs, they will not work. I don't know why, it's probably a science thing or something. You could really see the benefit of mixing the colors. Yes, they are a solid color in the game, but this feels way more like Norse magic. I did end up doing just a little bit of cleanup and gave these a quick pass of gloss clear coat before calling them done. Almost done, just need to do a pass of weathering with some black and brown acrylic wash to pull out all these juicy details. And this wash included everything. That means the leather straps as well. Really just adding a nice layer of grime to the whole thing. I also spent some extra time on the axe head to make sure all of these runic details stand out in the end. For the final touch, I added just a little bit of silver gilding wax from our Mjolnir build with a stiff fan brush to simulate some scratches and battle damage. Okay, now it's really time for the final step, the electronics. 
To get the gems a mounting point, I needed to add some material to mount corresponding magnets. However, I couldn't add too much thickness as this would interfere with the wireless LEDs. So I chose some thick black cardstock, the same that I used to seal the gems. This was mounted on the inside of the land jets with some popsicle sticks to create an offset. And then magnets were added to secure the gems in place. The system actually worked pretty well for something that was made of popsicle sticks, magnets, some glue, and a little bit of paper. Very kindergarten. I also added a little bit of foam to hold the electronics in. And again, I'm using the term electronics loosely. We will have a list of all the supplies we're using for our setup, but we are not electron electronicians. <laughs> but we are not electricians, and we can honestly not confirm if this is safe. From our testing, nothing bad happened, but be careful out there. I place our maybe bomb into the cavity, then wedge the remaining roundel and land jet into place. The model does include some spots for magnets, but we got a pretty positive fit without them. Also, this is easily removable for when we need to recharge the battery. Oh, did we mention the battery is rechargeable? When I say that I was shocked that this actually worked, I'm downplaying my reaction. This looks amazing and feels so magical. It looks so great, I ended up making a set of red gems as well. And these are so easy to swap out. Honestly, I could just do this all day. And I probably will. This is the most sophisticated thing we have made so far. The metal finish, the faux wood texture, the leather straps, and of course the wireless LEDs all came together to make an amazing replica. Having all the electronics hidden within the axe and the LEDs being wireless really hides any hint towards the use of electronics. No wires or plugs in sight, just gems that magically come to life when they're placed on the axe. I just, I can't stop playing with this. Thanks for watching. I hope this has inspired you to make a Leviathan axe of your own or to do something even cooler. See you in the next one.